I hear the Bialetti stovetop coffee maker is ready, so it's time to open our next letter, this one from James from Atherton. Dear Ezekiel, do you by chance remember the hilarious tale of Dr. De Vartolo and that Venetian waiter, Catface Laguna? I heard it when I was perhaps 10 years old from my father who had just returned from a business trip to Mendoza, Argentina, something about wine, but I have never heard anything about that tale since. We are talking about 40 years ago. It's almost as if that tale came from a forgotten world. James, thank you very much for your letter. And it is true, it is a forgotten world. But I am one of the few who remembers these tales. And I do think I remember something about a Dr. De Vartolo and a waiter by the name of Catface Laguna. I think the tale went something like this. <laughs> Part 1. Dr. De Vartolo Steam filled Lucio's round face as he looked into the pot of boiling ravioli. The chefs at El Pinguino could not help but smile with pity at the 35-year-old man who had to sneak into the kitchen like a child, fearing that his wife, who had become more like his mother, would catch him and put him down for being weak in the face of food. Everyone in Mendoza called Lucio gordo, pasta dough, or even panettone, but no one appreciated that it was only kitchens and food that could calm him down and remind him of the happy moments that he had experienced as a child when his grandmother would spend all day folding beef empanadas, rolling gnocchi, or mixing spinach ravioli with bolognese sauce. We go from the warmth and safety of our grandmother's kitchen into a cold, dangerous world, one full of pitfalls and traps, thought Lucio as his eyes followed a bay leaf that began to twirl in the boiling water. Since his late adolescence, Lucho had faced nothing but bad luck, a series of unfortunate incidents and health problems, all of which forced him to get involved in schemes that became more complicated and inescapable as the years passed. He was famous for always being nervous and in the middle of something, which usually meant some fracaso, which means utter disaster. A fracaso that was complicated and inextricably connected with innumerable, oth innumerable other fracasos. His family and friends never understood that, in truth, Lucho actually sought, never sought trouble, but only found himself more entangled in it whenever he tried to set himself loose from it. Lucho finally came to the conclusion that, ever since the age of 14, life had just chosen to be unkind to him, for reasons that he could never understand. Like my father says, life is a hurricane, he would tell his friends. Since a young age, he was always bloated, red-faced, nervous, and uncomfortable, with his stomach making embarrassing noises in public and with throbbing pains in the joints and abdomen, pains that made everyday life and work unbearable. His bad experiences and awareness of the wars overseas made him scared of the modern world and of what he perceived to be the general human predicament in which life turns on and off like a light bulb with no guarantee that the time in between will be pleasant. It was restaurant kitchens more than the church or even his own marriage where Lucho felt at peace. He got pleasure from hearing the din of dishes, seeing the steam accumulate underneath the ceiling and observing how the waiters, each with a white napkin folded over his forearm, single-mindedly transport plates to the tables. After sunset, it was the sound of bottles being uncorked that helped him forget his nighttime worries. The laughter of the drinking patrons assured him that maybe things are okay, at least for the moment. Tonight, he came into the kitchen to taste the new ravioli of Chef Tandil, the former chef of Caldo Major in Buenos Aires, and to meet his favorite waiter, the Venetian known as Catface Laguna. Catface promised Lucio a possible solution to all of his problems, an appointment with Dr. De Vartolo. Catface sprinted into the kitchen with a dish balanced on one hand and a shiny wet silver watch on the other arm. Because of his pot belly, his white waiter shirt protruded over his belt and black pants, with his right side noticeably chunkier than his left. He gave Lucio a one-armed hug and a quick kiss on the cheek. 
There's nothing better than fresh ravioli with thick, chewy pasta, huh, Gordo? Asked Catface. Catface moved his arms and hands with the quickness of someone who was trying to get out of work before being asked by the boss to stay on for more hours. It was a busy night at El Pinguino, and Catface knew that there was a good chance that he wouldn't be allowed to escape with Lucio. What a waiter Catface was. The well-to-do in Mendoza, like all people of good families, believed that the best waiters and butlers were those who did their work unseen and unnoticed, as if they weren't there. Unfortunately, Catface Laguna was the opposite of this. When patrons sat at the table, Catface would thrust personal conversations upon them, even when the customers were a couple on the first date. She's much prettier than the one you brought last week, he once mumbled to a little he once mumbled a little too loudly to a young man, embarrassing the man in front of his Saturday night date. Catface was known for telling stories that everyone knew weren't true, but everyone accepted that as part of his personality. When confronted about his tall telling, he once admitted that he intended to exaggerate only a little bit because reality was too harsh to discuss at the dinner table. Whether they wanted to hear it or not, Catface would tell patrons about tall tales or his daily ups and downs, or at worst, about how coming to work to serve people made him unable to carry out his daily errands. So sorry to hear it, a caballero once replied, eating his dinner now with a sense of guilt. On a busy night like tonight, the three thick hairs on his otherwise bald head, the hairs were actually tight bundles of many thick hairs stuck together, would drip a combination of kitchen steam and sweat, as if Catface had just crawled out of a Venetian canaletto. One time, three drops glided from his hair straight into the puchero soup of an upper-class senora. Oh my goodness, said the woman, making a face of disgust. Lady, I can serve food but not fight gravity, he said to her. But it was when around Lucio that Cafes Laguna was at his finest. Lucio was the only person to whom Catface was completely honest, Ever since Lucio was a child, Catface always came through for Lucio, and this was the only thing that kept Catface from believing all the rumors that were said about him and his many tall tales. Every liar must have an anchor, believed Catface, a person to whom he is completely honest. Without an anchor, like a ship lost at sea, the liar himself becomes lost and confused, no longer knowing what is true or false, thought Catface Laguna. Helping Lucio by obtaining this appointment with Dr. DeVartolo was so important to Catface that days earlier, just thinking about tonight brought a tear to the Venetian's eye. Catface, the ravioli are perfect, al dente, concluded Lucio, chewing the ravioli while continuing to look down at them. Too bad that I have to chew them quickly so that Veronica won't catch me eating. And because we are running late, added Catface, raising his cat-like eyebrows and pointing at his steam-covered watch. The doctor doesn't appreciate tardiness. Did you bring the materials he requested? Uh, I got the crate of wines, the panettone, and the dulce de membrillo, said Lucio. We must hurry, said Catface. I had to lie through my nose to get us this meeting with Dr. DeVartolo. I heard that the doctor never reschedules a missed appointment. Although an important plan of action was in place, both men stood idle in the middle of the kitchen corridor. One of them was chewing al dente ravioli, while the other was between one action and the next. They should have been in a hurry, but like good Mendocinos, they decided to wait it out and simply stare at each other. Catface knew that it would be wrong to rush anyone who was chewing freshly made pasta. Gulping down ravioli or tortellini are grave sins. We are not tuna swallowing fish whole right off the shores of my beloved Venice, he once cautioned the hungry patron. While Lucio finished the last ravioli, Catface decided to use this time wisely and have one quick glass of his favorite, Averna, for the road, he said. The two then clapped their moccasins against the black cobblestones of the streets of Mendoza. <laughs>
Part 2. Chakras in Via Monte. Dr. De Vartolo lived on the top floor of a French-style triangular building that took its shape from the delta formed by the convergence of Chakra Street and Via Monte Way. From the street, one can see the top of the six-story building and count the illuminated windows of Dr. De Vartolo's triangular office. The lights were always the last to go out on any given night. Inside, old Dr. De Vartolo could always be found flipping through pages of his beloved neurological journals. Mendocinos were proud that such an intellectual with an international following was one of their own, and, even more, that Dr. De Vartolo decided to return to his province after having been educated abroad. Like the office of any true scholar, the room was filled with books, globes of the world, scientific instruments, and figurines. Dr. De Vartolo did not have an answer for everything, but he could be counted on to know what was known and what was unknown in the day's science. Dr. De Vartolo believed that, at the present stage of scientific understanding, a practitioner must first and foremost be a pragmatist, that is, be practical and willing to mix as many possible medical treatments as possible, unless, of course, the treatments are mutually exclusive, a term Dr. De Vartolo uh, used quite often. He believed that people tended to think needlessly in black and white terms, as if the simultaneous introduction of multiple treatments of various sorts, including those of old wives' tales, were impermissible. This unnecessary black and white type of thinking was what Dr. De Vartolo considered to be the human predilection. When people incorrectly thought of things as mutually exclusive, Dr. De Vartolo would reveal to them how the two things could easily co-occur. He then would finish the conversation by stating, Don't feel silly. It is the way we are all wired to think. He would often say, It is only vanity that keeps a doctor from trying both treatments, or, for that matter, from trying every treatment. He once warned a young student, The quickest way to look smart is to be skeptical about every new proposal. But keep in mind that the skeptic would not have noticed the mold growing on Fleming's bread, and that led to the discovery of penicillin. One time, Joaquin Delanoy, the French neurosurgeon, criticized Dr. De Vartolo for treating a Mendocino by removing empacho. Empacho is a pre-Columbian technique attributed to the Araucanians in which indigestion is treated by tugging repeatedly on the skin of a patient's back so hard that a popping sound is made. Dr. De Vartolo defended himself, declaring, Dr. Delanoy, I should remind you, first, I am a pragmatist. Second, this is South America. Things are different down here. Even illness is different down here. Before his cozy office in the delta between Chakras and Viamonte, Dr. De Vartolo paid his dues by working endless nights in the medical wards of the poorest parts of the world and in the outskirts of Buenos Aires. Part 3. The Jeta Equation. Jeta means bad luck. Lucho and Catface arrived in the waiting room on time after running up the six flights of stairs. Enter. A voice echoed through the doctor's consultorio. The two men looked at each other and opened a heavy door, three inches thick and decorated with reliefs of mortars, pestles, and the busts of Greek and Roman medical doctors, including Hippocrates and Galen. Inside, the consultorio resembled more the quarters of a diplomat than a doctor's office. The room had a red carpet resembling the kind belonging only to royalty. The white walls, white molding, White fluted columns and white floorboards were meticulously clean and bright. Everything was royal red or shiny white. From the center of the room emanated a sharp white light from Dr. De Vartolo's desk lamp, one brought from Africa and having a shade made of dark green onyx. Behind the desk, the two men could see the bald head of Dr. De Vartolo, who was seated and smoking a pipe. The pipe was made of white pearl with a yellow lip. Dr. De Vartolo was gently flipping through the journal, Annals of Aberrant Neurological Findings. The doctor did not look up at the two men. At the office door, his desk was huge and decorated with elaborate reliefs. On it was a leather letter box, 
two empty glasses, three empanadas, and beige paper stacked neatly into four piles. Lucho and Catface looked at the two large windows that they had seen so many times, but only from the street side. They were finally inside the famous place. The men approached the two chairs before the doctor's desk. Dr. DeVartolo did not look up at the men, but only adjusted his reading glasses and continued to smoke his pipe and flip pages. The two guests could see that the reading glasses had left an indelible impression on the thick skin behind the doctor's ears. The old neurologist was completely bald except for one small square patch of hair above each ear. The patches were accompanied only by a large rectangular mustache below a large nose. Take seats, said Dr. DeVartolo, waving his free left hand to the two chairs before the desk. The two men sat down on French chairs that had been re reupholstered with Argentine cowhide. DeVartolo closed his journal and, for the first time, looked over his glasses at Catface, then at Lucho, and then back at Catface. Did you bring the items? Yes, doctor, said Catface. Where should I put them? Next to the globe, please, said the doctor, pointing to the globe next to the library. The good doctor, Dr. DeVartolo always spoke with a calm but firm voice, a trick he learned from the famous Dr. Caballero of Buenos Aires. Catface carefully lowered the objects on the red carpet by the library. You certainly keep late hours, doctor, said Catface. I don't like to retire to sleep till after I hear the clacking sounds of the last drunkard making his way home through Via Monte, or the last echoes of a couple arguing or laughing on their way back home, usually through chakras. It is always quite a night out here in the city of Mendoza, said the doctor. For the night is the ultimate accomplice for people to commit bad deeds. The night does strange things to otherwise normal Mendocinos. When the night comes out, it is as if the future or the possible end of one's life matter no more. You see, the night is the biggest foe a healer has. For the Mendocino to recover from his vices, I sometimes advise him to spend several months in one of those Scandinavian countries in which there is no night for months on end. Only there, in the absence of the night, does the Provinciano have a chance to overcome his weaknesses? So yes, I must keep late hours, Senor Laguna. As a doctor, I feel more responsible if I retire after all of the night's business has come to an end. It is a duel that she, the troublemaker, and I, the trouble fixer, have every night. And so it will be till I depart this life. The men sat quietly letting the doctor continue his exposition. Unlike in most of the world, most of the diseases I treat in this province are due not to the lack of nutrition or medicine, but to indulgences, especially, but not limited to, overeating and overdrinking. These are what I call the Argentine diseases of consumption, concluded Dr. DeVartolo, speaking as if reading a telegram. He looked at Cafes and asked, does the whole city have to party on every single night? The room was quiet. Feeling the collective guilt of the partying ways of the Mendocinos, Catface replied, Well, you know, the truth is that some people party on one night and other people party on another night, but because there's always someone doing partying on any given night, it seems like all of Mendoza is partying every night, but, but that's probably not the case. The doctor kept staring at Catface as if time had stopped. The hand that was flipping through the journal was now motionless. Dr. DeVartolo then showed a tired half-smile, the kind that professionals who work with the public often wear. The room was quiet for so long, Catface felt compelled to add something. Of course, doctor, I am not aware I am not an expert in the quantitative sciences. You know all this much more than a humble waiter like me. Dr. DeVartolo looked away from Catface, closed the journal, and said, I would like to now hear again all the facts that Catface brought to my attention weeks ago, but this time from Lucho himself. I have already consulted with Professor Rivarola and the Brujo Isidro Madridi about this case, but as a professional, 
I would like to verify all the facts so that I can make a diagnosis as accurately as possible. Of course, this extra verification is not at all due to Senior Catface Laguna's unfair reputation as one who tends to, um, let us say, embellish the facts. Just, just a tad, added Catface, raising his hand and pinching his fingers as if holding a small thing. With his arms crossed over his stomach, Lucha said, I don't know where to begin. Things have always been so bad. Please tell me what a typical day of yours is like from the time you were in secondary school until now, said Dr. DeVartolo. Okay, said Lucho, looking at the doctor and then looking down. In the mornings, I would always be tired, and when I would go to school, my stomach would hurt and make loud noises, especially after a café con leche. In class, these noises would embarrass me. I would get nervous. My head and back of my neck would get wet. Some kids would make fun of me, calling me pedoso, which means fart-laden. In the afternoons, I would always have strong headaches. As an adult, things only got worse. I would stay up every night worried about financial matters and health problems. Then I had several infections in my abdomen, which required many hospital stays and surgeries. And then when I was 20, I had two hernias, lung problems, bone aches, and I also had... Dr. DeWartzel interrupted. And, and how about your work life? Lucha took a deep breath and said, It has always been a struggle. I have always had money problems. Every job I undertook was a failure. And your personal life? Asked Dr. DeWartzel. Despite being a bag of problems, I always had good friends. They would tell me that my life was a tango, that I was a tornado of bad news, but that as good Argentines, they would still stick with me. Sadly, many of them have passed away before their time. It is all very sad. And your romantic life? asked Dr. DeVartolo. Well, I have a wife who loves me but always puts me down because of all my problems. She calls me panettone because of my flabbiness. When I am down, she becomes even harsher because she can't stand the sight of a weakened man, which is what I have become. Catface told me that you have other, more personal problems, would you mind corroborating this by whispering the private facts into my left ear? Lucho got up, looked at the empanadas on the desk, walked around the desk, and leaned over to whisper the requested information into Dr. DeVartolo's left ear. Dr. DeVartolo kept staring straight ahead, sparing Lucho any eye contact during this embarrassing but medically necessary moment. I see, said Dr. DeVartolo. That is most unfortunate and debilitating. Lucho sat back down, crossing his arms over his stomach. Well, gentlemen, I think I have all the facts that are needed for a diagnosis, said Dr. DeVartolo. Oh, one last thing, doctor, added Lucho. Yes, as a doctor. I forgot to mention that if I have more than just two glasses of wine, my stomach and head feel very bad all through the whole night and next day. I see, said Dr. DeVartolo. Catface pointed to the medical journal and said with a smile, He suffers from empacho, right, doctor? No, my dear Catface, said Dr. DeVartolo. Empacho is not the diagnosis. Then what is the diagnosis, doctor? asked Catface. DeVartolo removed his eyeglasses and looked straight at Catface Laguna. This man is cursed, concluded Dr. DeVartolo. Cursed? Lucho and Catface uttered in unison. Yes, said Dr. DeVartolo. This is what we consider a typical case of the evil eye. Someone once gave you an evil eye, Lucho. The two guests were motionless. You see, added Dr. DeVartolo, the medical records which I reviewed this afternoon reveal that a young Lucho Heriberto Martinez, son of the engineer Dom Boca, was hospitalized at the age of 14 for appendicitis then hospitalized at 16 for peritonitis, then hospitalized at 25 for three, not two, as you recall, hernias, then at 26 for diverticulo uh, diverticulitis, and then later for bladder infections, and then later for still more things. The list goes on and on. Do you gentlemen know what the probability of getting appendicitis is? asked Dr. DeVartolo. No, said the two men. It is 0.06, which means 
Six out of a hundred. I see, said Catface. Six out of a hundred. That means it's a rare thing. Do you gentlemen know what the probability of having two hernias is? Asked the doctor. No, said the two men. Well, it is 0 0.005, said the doctor, which is five out of a thousand. I see, said the men. And the other digestive ailments Lucio had, continued Dr. DeVartolo, are associated in the literature with the respective probabilities of 0 0.04, 0 0.05, 0 0.07, 0 0.02, 0 0.02, 0 0.006, and 0 0.09. The doctor leaned forward toward the men. Do you know where I am going with all of this? He asked. Uh, not a clue, doctor, said Catface, making a smile. Me neither, said Lucho, looking down. The combined probability of experiencing all these illnesses in one lifetime is point zero, 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 six. The two men raised their eyebrows. Six, repeated Catface. Hmm, nodding as if he was surprised that it was six and not some other number. Lucho did not understand the math, but could appreciate that this meant that having all those illnesses in one patient was a rare thing. Now, let's consider the pulmonary problems, continued the doctor. You know what the probability is of finding a Mendocino that has all these pulmonary problems, asked Dr. DeVartolo. No, said Lucho. Not a clue, said Catface. Well, it's point zero, started the doctor with a pause after zero. Uh-huh replied Lucho. Zero, continued Dr. DeVartolo, looking straight at the man. Aha, uh -huh, said the man. Zero, continued the doctor. Yes, whispered the man in, in unison. Zero, 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 four, finished Dr. DeVartolo. Wow, said Lucho. So this time it's four, added Catface, shaking his head from side to side as if considering, as if considering what do you know? This time it's four. The doctor continued his exposition. You say that you get sick from two glasses of wine, correct? Yes, said Lucho. Well, no Mendocino gets sick from even four glasses of wine, right, Catface? asked Dr. DeVartolo. That's what one drinks at church, said Catface. No one I know gets sick from that. And we haven't even taken into account all of your financial bad luck and the many personal tragedies you mentioned which could lower your jeta fraction, that is your bad, luck, your bad luck fraction, even further. You see, everyone's life is associated with a simple fraction, the combined probability of the occurrence of all the bad things that ever happened in that life. For most Mendocinos, it is never below 0.10, but in your case, it is astronomically lower, far too low to stem from mere coincidences. Dr. DeVartolo asked Lucio, You've spoken about my stomach problems, lung problems, finances, personal tragedies, but you never mentioned anything about my wife who is always putting me down, said Lucho. Because that is normal, said Dr. DeVartolo. Yes, typical, concurred Catface. That is not part of the curse, clarified Dr. DeVartolo. Don't need a curse for that, added Catface. It is, how do you say, part of sacred matrimony. I see, said Lucho. The species of evil eye that you received, continued the doctor, affects only health, finances, and friends. It is actually what practitioners consider a mild to medium curse. There are far worse curses out there. The problem in your case was just that you've kept the curse around for too long. But now the solution is at hand. Early this morning, I telephoned the Brujo, the witch, Madridi. He said that, it being such a mild curse, he could cure you remotely. That is, we could be here, sitting in this office within these walls, and he could be in his home up in the mountains, but he can still cure you, as if he were here. For this, Madridi requested only the wines, the panettone, and the can of dulce de membrillo. The curse should be lifted at midnight which is 30 minutes away, but to see that the cure works, we must first test a few things. Dr. DeVartolo brought out an empty bottle of wine that was filled with a liquid that looked like chocolate milk. 
he poured the concoction into the two glasses on the desk. Gentlemen, bon appetit, said the doctor. Catface and Lucho started drinking the liquid. Tastes good, what is it? asked Catface. It is chocolate milk with a little bit of coffee and a tad of Averna, the kind of drink that has historically produced symptoms in Lucho. Dr. De Vartolo started lecturing about the function of acids in the stomach and how fats cause for the acids to increase. While drinking the liquid, Lucho felt nervous, so nervous that he kept eyeing the empanadas that were on the desk. Dr. De Vartolo paused his lecture upon noticing that Lucho kept looking at the empanadas. Please go ahead and have an empanada, said Dr. De Vartolo, gently pushing with his pipe the dish toward Lucio. Are the empanadas also for the test? asked Catface, who also took a big bite out of an empanada. No, said Dr. De, Walter, De Vartolo. They were my dinner. Oh, said Catface, uh... I am so sorry, slowly putting the bitten empanada back on the dish. The silence held by the three men was broken by loud noises emanating from Lucio's stomach. Reminds me of Venice, of the creaking sounds of the moored ships, observed Catface. With the pipe in his mouth, Dr. De Vartolo approached Lucio and began looking straight at his abdomen. Most interesting, he said, gently touching the stomach. Doctor, I am now also getting those wine headaches I always get, said Lucio. Then this is a good simulation, said the doctor. As the men waited for the clock to strike midnight, Dr. De Vartolo noticed that Catface's right side seemed a little bit bloated. <clears throat> he asked Catface to stand by his desk so that he could examine him. Dr. De Vartolo began touching Catface's chest, underarms, and right abdomen. You have some inflammation and solidification in the liver, said the doctor. What does that mean? asked Catface, with his eyes looking everywhere in fear, even looking at Lucho, though Lucho had no answers. It means that you're drinking and eating too much. Your liver is being punished for it. Let us see what happens, says Dr. De Vartolo, gently pressing against the abdomen. Ooh, ee, ah, ooh, howled Catface in pain with his head pointing up and his eyes closed. He jerked his drink up in the air, but managed not to drop it. Dr. De Vartolo removed his hand. Did anyone ever tell you that you should eat and drink healthily? He said. Yes, said Catface, rushing back to his seat to avoid any more examinations. Well, now you know why, said the doctor, looking over his glasses. What is the treatment, dear doctor? Is it that I too am cursed? Did someone give me the evil eye? Was it that one unhappy customer at El Pinguino? Is, is death waiting for me right around the corner? My beloved cat face, said Dr. DeVartolo, you will be fine. Please do not worry. Don't you know that prevaricators like you live on forever? Your deceptions are an antidote against the real killer, which is reality. From now on, why don't you just have one instead of two glasses of wine with lunch? Dr. De Vartolo turned to Lucio and said, That's the only time of day when Mendocinos find it easy to cut down on the wine. Thank you, doctor. I will follow your recommendation. Till the day I die, I will have only one glass of Averna during lunch, said Catface, signaling one with his pudgy finger. Otherwise, said Dr. De Vartolo, keep on living and enjoying the rest of your days as you have always been, which I know is what you will do anyway. For a provinciano of your disposition, there is no point in trying to change what you do once the night comes out. So just try to have healthier lunches during the day. Lucho's stomach noises became louder and stranger, and his face became more and more red and sweaty. Twelve dongs were heard, and the two hands of Dr. De Vartolo's large clock were finally over each other. The time has come, said Dr. De Vartolo adjusting his glasses and approaching Lucho with a magnifying glass. Catface turned to look at Lucho's face, body, and hands. Dios mio, he shouted. The facha, which means face, of the gordo went from a freckled red to a nice clear olive beige. The cheek slowly deflated and the sweat behind his neck dried up. Changes too difficult to describe by Catface and Dr. De Vartolo seem to occur in the chest and abdomen, abdominal regions. The abdomen 
looked like an overfilled balloon losing some air and then reaching a comfortable tension. Dr. De Vartolo inspected the changes with his magnifying glass. My goodness, I feel great, said Lucho. I feel like I have never felt before. I can't believe it. Lucho drank more of the concoction straight from the bottle to make sure that the cure was not just a temporary mirage. He finished Dr. De Vartolo's empanadas and left not one drop of the concoction in the bottle. He could not believe that his stomach had nothing to say about it. It is interesting, but the cure will be hard for you to accept, said Dr. De Vartolo. You see, the ill become accustomed to being ill. As the years go by, their minds cannot imagine being without their ailment or deformity. But in time, you will accept your new reality. Like I said, it was a mild to medium curse that went neglected for too many years. Lucho began to cry. These are tears of joy, I hope, said Dr. De Vartolo. Catface leaned toward Lucho, now only half sitting on his chair so that he could put his arm around his weeping friend. Doctor, the tears are half of joy and half of regret, said Lucho. You see, as an adolescent, someone once mentioned to me that I must be cursed, but I never believed in those things because my father is an engineer. He raised me to have a scientific mindset and not believe in cocoliche, which means rubbish. He told me to not believe in things like the evil eye. I respect Don Boca's views tremendously, said Dr. De Vartolo. But medicine is too young a science for a practitioner to have the luxury of omitting a possible treatment that may work for his patients, even if the cure works in ways that are not yet understood. I myself don't care if the treatment appears sophisticated or like cocoliche. My goal is simply to cure my mendocinos. The scientific approach works very well in Europe and North America, but this is South America. Even illness and its treatment are different down here. Lucho kept weeping. Only after 25 years of suffering do I learn that everything could have been resolved so easily. I could have taken the medicines and have also gone to Madrid. It didn't have to be one or the other. What a fool I have been, he said. Don't feel silly, pibe, said Dr. De Bartolo, taking off his glasses and wearing the smile that professionals must wear when interacting with the public. That is the way we are all wired to think, he said.